Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew's Gospel in the 13th chapter, Matthew 13. If you're visiting with us this morning and you don't have a copy of God's Word, you should find one in the seat in front of you. It looks just like this. And if you turn to page 972, you will find Matthew 13. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, then feel free to take this one home with you as our gift to you. Matthew 13. I'm going to start reading in the 24th verse, and then I'm going to skip down to the 36th verse. So I'm going to read just a portion of the parable of the weeds and then the explanation. Matthew 13, 24. He, Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, before I start this morning, I want to just um, make a note about the sermon card. Some of you pay attention to the sermon card. A while ago, I developed the practice of trying to plan ahead as much as I could, and particularly with sermon series, to write out the, the date the title of the message, and the scripture that we would be covering. And a lot of you find that to be helpful. And I picked that up uh, from a well-known, reputable preacher who said that I should do that. And I thought, well, I don't really want to do that. Um, because, and, and I have a lot of colleagues who don't want to do that. You know why we don't want to do that is because we don't like feeling locked in. Like, oh my goodness. And that's it. So I, I figured, I said, listen, this guy's a lot smarter and better than I am. I, if he says it's a good idea, I'm going to do it. And so I did. And of the group, my group, I think I'm the only one. And my buddies, they won't do it. And they, so they say, they say, well, what if, what if you've got this all planned out and then and, 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 and you find out later on that you miss something or that it's going to take longer than you thought and you have to change it? And what if the Spirit leads and you, you have to do something different? And, you know, they're all, all panicked about it. So they can't do this. And so here's what happens if that happens. <laughs> you change the sermon card. That's it. It's that easy, right? So this morning, as I, I was preparing this message, and as I was getting into it, I realized, oh, my goodness, this is not going to fit. And you've been very patient with me at times, but I know you and I love you. I love my sheep and I know that you would much rather hear two 30-minute sermons as opposed to one 60-minute sermon. And that's what the thing is boiling down to. And so I thought, well, you know what? We'll change the card. I do apologize for those of you who that might cause a little glitch for. I know that we're just going to be a week off, okay? You've got to push it forward a little bit and, um, and, and I think you'll be okay. 
Anyway, this is a real true test, because I think this is the first time in a few years that I've actually altered the sermon. Is that right? Does anybody remember? Any? Yeah, I, think, I think that's right, so, so bear with me. If I told you that among the some 7.2 billion inhabitants in this world, that there are really only two types of people, what would you think? Some of you would say, well, of course there are only two types of people. There are morning people and people who want to shoot morning people. That's... <laughs> Robert Frost divides us up this way. The poet, he says, there are those who work and the rest who are willing to let them. Or might you prefer Mark Twain's observation, there are those who accomplish things and those who claim to have accomplished things. Well, according to the revelation of God, the one who made all the people in the world, the one in whose image all people are made, the one who loves diversity as evidenced by his very own creation, there really are ultimately two types of people. They are described in scripture in many different ways. There are those who go away into eternal punishment and those who inherit eternal life. There are children of light and children of dark. There are sheep, and there are goats. There are those who are for Jesus and those who are against him. There are sons of the kingdom and sons of the evil one. I could go on and on, but you get the gist, I'm sure. All people, all of us, are of one sort or another. We are either gods or we're not gods. In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about these two groups. I'm going to read a rather lengthy portion of scripture to you now, and I would suggest... If it helps you, maybe close your eyes and listen to these words of Jesus. It comes from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, that you might hopefully receive the full import of what Christ is trying to get across here. These are the words of Jesus about these two groups. When the Son of Man come in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Two types of people in this world, or to bring this closer to home, very likely two types of people in our family. Two types of people in our school. Two types of people in our places of work. Though you might not have thought much about this, likely two types of people in our churches. This reality that our churches are made up of two types of people, the saved and the unsaved, is why the Westminster Confession of Faith and other Reformed confessions distinguish between what their authors term the visible and the invisible church, a distinction that is made uh, to communicate that there may be 
non-Christians in the church or false Christians in the church and true Christians outside the church. It follows St. Augustine's thinking, who said, there are many sheep without and many wolves within. That's the context of Jude's epistle that we've been studying for the last five weeks. He's written to Christians. He's urging them to contend for their faith because non-Christians have become part of their fellowship, have made their way into it. And the apostles predicted that this would happen. The apostle Paul, speaking to the elders in the church of Ephesus, you find it in Acts chapter 20, he said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. We often worry about threats from outside the church. But the scripture tells us to watch about what's happening inside the church, the threats that are coming from inside. Jesus himself warns us of these ones. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are as ravenous wolves. Six weeks we are into the study of Jude. and We know by now that this brother and servant of Jesus Christ intends to pull off all the sheep's clothing and expose the predators for what they are. And he does this by pointing out not so much what they look like, per se, but how they behave. So this morning, we're going to take up yet another list of traits, the traits of the ungodly. And I bet it's going to feel like some of you, to some of you, that we are beating this drum again. Like, seriously, Scott, again? Another list of ungodly things. How long are you going to pluck this string anyway? As, until the text runs out. That's how long. Because we preach the text, right? But I do want you to think about this a little bit differently this week than perhaps in weeks past. Okay? What I would like to do is to go through this particular list of traits. And again, we'll do some next week. I want you to encourage you this morning to consider them as personal. Or to think about these not as just an account of something, some bad actors back in Israel's history. But to think. Try these shoes on for you. Do these traits fit you or resemble you in any way? As we look at the conduct and as we look at the mindset of the false teacher, ask yourself, am I like this? Am I like this? Are, are, are these things in some way present in me? The reason I would like you to do that is because honest answers will be diagnostic. So let's... Uh, entertain three possibilities for those who are willing to play along, okay? First of all, if we evaluate ourselves against these godless traits, and we have to say, yes, I do that. Yes, I am like that. That's in my life. Then, assuming that we are genuine believers, the presence of these things in our lives tells us something. It tells us there's a part of our relationship with God that is out of order. That godless traits have no place in the life of the godly. It tells us that something is broken. It tells us that something may be undeveloped or underdeveloped. It tells us things need to be fixed and require some attention. So that's one possibility. A second possibility is that if we evaluate ourselves against these godless traits, and we have to say again, yes, I do that. I do that with some regularity, or yes, that's me. That's in me. Then maybe we should not assume that we are genuine believers. Because maybe the existence of these things in our lives is showing us that we're not believers at all. And that's kind of what Jude is driving at, saying, listen, we'll know whether you're a Christian or not by the fruit in your life, whether it is godly and good or ungodly and wicked. There are a lot of people who assume that they are Christians that may not be. Thirdly, if we evaluate ourselves against these ungodly traits and we can say, no, I am not like that. I don't do that. I don't think that way. That's not my mindset. It's not my attitude. It's not my behavior. If we can do that, then we have a cause for rejoicing, do we not? Because God then, by his power and grace, has enabled us at some point to say no to ungodliness and has given us the power we need to live upright, godly lives. So we could say, if we'd say, no, those traits are not in me, we can say then in the spirit of John Newton, converted slave trader, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Or another way to say that is if I were left to myself, I'd be something entirely different. Right? If we're left to ourselves, the picture probably won't be too pretty. But God is a God who changes people. God is a God 
who lifts us out of miry clay. God is the one who transforms us, who makes us new. And when we see that he's doing that in our lives, he deserves the praise for it. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to our scripture from Jude for this morning. It's Jude verses 14 to 19, pages 1,216, and the Bible's provided. I'm going to believe that by now you know how to find the little book of Jude. But if you don't, go to the book of Revelation and take a left. One book back, tucked in behind Revelation, is a little epistle of Jude. Jude, verse 14. We're jumping in the middle like we have been, parachuting into Jude's argument against the false teachers. That's what he's talking about here. It was also about these, the false teachers, that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Well, let's begin by noting something I think you probably picked up in those few verses, and that is repetition of a particular word. That word is ungodly. Three times at least that shows up there. Ungodliness shows up one more time. Whenever you're reading a passage of Scripture and you see such a repetition as that, like I would do, I would take a pencil and I would circle those. Because that tells you what's going on in that particular passage. That tells you what the author's aim is, what the author wants to focus in on. What Jude wants us to know here is that these men are ungodly. Right? It is that simple. He just spent, we talked about it last week, six metaphors, stack metaphor upon metaphor, describing the uselessness, the emptiness, and the danger of these false teachers. And now, make no mistake about it, he wants you to know these guys are not of God. They look like you. They can act like you. They're in the middle of you. They're doing some of the same things that you're doing, but they are not of God. And, and the most scathing indictment that he has is that they are devoid of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in them. Therefore, they cannot be Christians. They are not Christians. Now, we're going to make our way through this list. We're just going to cover three of these characteristics, these traits. Uh, we're going to look at a few of these ungodly behaviors, and we're also going to look at what I would consider a godly or a Christian alternative to them. Okay, we're going to begin in verse 16 where Jude tells us that these men are grumblers. If you're reading the King James Version, it might say murmurers. That's hard to say, murmurers. I like that word better, though, because we all know murmurers, don't we? We all know people who are <laughs> grumbling under their breath kind of thing. People are it's talking against things. The original Jewish hearer would, would hearken right back to the Exodus generation here. Because remember what God had against them? They grumbled against God. They murmured against God. These are the ones who didn't believe that God was with them. These are the ones who didn't believe that God would take care of them, that God would not provide for them. And so they grumbled against God, and they rebelled against God. And as a, as a result, God said they will not enter the promised land. Their bodies dropped in the wilderness. They didn't get in. M. Craig James is an author, a pastor, a teacher. He has a particular name for this group. He calls them the rabble, the rabble. In every gathering of God's people, there's always a rabble. There is always a rabble, murmurers, doubters, the ones who, who don't even fear God. They are quick to lodge a case against him. By the way, in case you haven't picked up on this, this is not the group to be part of. This is something you want to avoid. This is not how we want to be, okay? Philippians 2.14 instructs us, do all things without what? Murmuring, grumbling or complaining, murmuring or disputing. That's what the scripture tells us. So we aren't to grumble as Christians, which means 
One way to avoid this particular form of ungodliness, one godly alternative, is for us to shut up. For us to be quiet. It's for us to zip our lips. It's for us to follow that old saying, if you don't have something nice to say, say anything at all. That is a start, right? But you know what? That's not the solution. That's not the cure. That's a good place to start. But grumbling is more than words. Grumbling is more than a tone of voice. Grumbling is just an outward expression of what's happening on the inside. When we find ourselves grumbling, it's because we're deeply dissatisfied in our hearts. We grumble when we think things aren't the way they should be. We grumble when we are anxious. We grumble when we are fearful that things won't turn out the way that we want them to. And that's what prompts Craig James to write, the most dangerous rabble are not the complaining people around us, but the rabble that live within the heart. He says, this is why I've never understood the advice that says, just trust your heart. He writes, if your heart is like mine, most days there's a bad committee meeting going on in there. So you have to make choices about which inner voice you're going to honor, or the rabble of anxiety will overwhelm you. There's a bad committee meeting going on in the hearts of most of us. Voices that are clamoring to be heard. Which one will you listen to? Which one will you believe? The Christian alternative to grumbling, I believe Jesus demonstrated this in overcoming his temptations in his own wilderness experience, is to believe God. We combat grumbling when we quietly trust in God's perfect will for us. That God has and God most certainly will take care of us. Second ungodly attribute of the false teachers is that they are malcontent. King James Version says they are complainers. The New International translates that fault finder. These are the people who are perpetually unhappy with their lot in life. Some people shake their fist at God for not performing to their liking. Others just bemoan their circumstances all the time. They are never satisfied. Things are never quite right. They are never good enough. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you know a couple of people like that. Or maybe this morning you're sitting here going, that is me. What is at the heart of that? Why are we so quick to be critical and find fault and complain? A lot of things, a lot of possibilities anyway. Let me name a few. How about ingratitude? Start thankful for all that we have. How about entitlement? We're not getting what we deserve. Or pride. I'm better than that. Deserve better treatment than that. Or selfishness, a view of life that is always me first. We complain again, we find fault when things are not measuring up to our standards. And we are the standard of judgment there, right? The basis of judgment is again how we think things should be, what we believe we deserve. And so the godly alternative to complaining, which all of us are probably guilty of, the godly alternative to finding fault is easy to say, it's so much harder to do. It is this though. It is to learn and to practice content. I want to stop complaining and learn how to be content. So the words of Paul in Philippians 4, 11 to 13 say, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. My contentment is not based in my circumstances. It doesn't have to go a certain way for me to be okay because I can do all things, anything God wants me to do through Christ who strengthens me. Have you thought about this, friend, that our satisfaction in life is directly related to our satisfaction in Christ? When we complain... We are saying that God is not enough. When we complain, we are saying that God is not doing something that he ought to do. 
And yet, in reality, we know this theologically. We know this. God is enough. Christ is sufficient. And the truth is, we're always getting better than what we deserve, right? I mean, we're always getting more than what we deserve. Are you content? And before you race to answer that, let me, let me offer a follow-up so you can think about that. Am I content? Am I a content person? But here's the follow-up, or maybe here's the test. Is your contentment evident by your speech? The way that you talk, the things that you say, and how you say them, does it evidence contentment in your life? There's a third observation that Jude makes of the false teachers, that they are following after their own desires. King James says they're walking after their own lusts. The message paraphrase describes it this way. They are grabbing for the biggest piece of the pie. And those of you who like grain suppers, you know what this is about. Right? You know because you got to get there early. But you got to get there when the door opens so you get the right seat, so you get your meal, so that you can get the right pie and the biggest piece. And some of you are going, What's he talking about? You go to a grain supper, you'll know what I'm talking about. You got to box people out to get that. That's what these guys are like. They're forward, they're selfish, they're thinking only about themselves. How can I get what I want? Paul would say that their God is their belly. It's true. They are governed not by self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, by, but by the opposite. They are governed by their natural instinct. And this isn't the first time that Judas made this allegation. In verse 10, he criticized, criticizes these heretics for being blasphemers, for speaking recklessly, pontificating about things that they know nothing of, while at the same time being destroyed by the things that they do know, which happens to be living by their own instincts. He says, like unreasoning animals. Now, it's coming to be fall, and whenever I think of natural instincts and unreasoning, uh, unreasoning animals leading to destruction, I think of a white-tailed buck. For 11 and a half months out of the year, he is arguably the smartest, savviest animal in the forest. And then comes a time of the year known as the rut. You know where I'm going with this? Some of you still don't. That is when his drive to mate overwhelms every other sense that he has and makes him an idiot. He is duped in that moment by a hunter's tricks. He is nowhere near as observant as he usually is. He even runs blindly out into traffic. Some of you have hit those bucks that were running out into traffic. Some of you have had near misses with those bucks running out into traffic. And you say, what is going on with this deer? Why is this deer acting this way? Listen, he's on the trail of a hot doe. That's what he's doing. He's following his natural instincts. His natural instincts, however, cause him to be undiscerning and leads him to almost certain destruction. And that's what the false teachers are doing. They're following their natural instincts. They're, they're following whatever their feelings tell them to do. Their adage would be, if it feels good, do it. And that's going to be their demise. Albert Barnes points out the grave is the home to which the sensualist rapidly travel. Now, I want to stop here, but I don't want to stop on such a grim note. And I don't want to leave you without hope. If you are here today and you have never known Jesus, never known him as your Savior or Lord, or if even with just these three traits that we've picked up this morning, you see an uncomfortable presence of them in your day-to-day -day life. And here's a message that I want us to end on. It's from Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2, Paul's writing to Titus, and he says this, verses 11 to 14, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, 
upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself people for his own possession, who are zealous for good work. Now that, right, that passage right there could be a sermon or a couple of sermons, but I want to boil it down to this. I want to give you something to take home, a thought to take home. We can say no to sin when we say yes to Jesus. That's, that's what I think that can be boiled down to. We can say no to sin when we say yes to Jesus. A lot of us are going to think that the way to overcome ungodliness, we've heard a little bit about ungodliness, we're a little uncomfortable with, you know, I think it as a Christian, I'm a fault finder, I'm a complainer, I, I follow my own instincts, what am I going to do? And, and right away, people are going to say, well, you know, the way to overcome this is, to, I guess I have to be more godly. I have to try harder. And that's what we do. We, we knuckle down. We're going to try harder, not make those same mistakes, not, not, not do that again. You know what this passage teaches us? It teaches us that grace is what trains us to renounce, a word that means to deny. Grace is what trains us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. Grace is the undeserved favor of God, right? And Paul says it has appeared, that is, it has, it has been revealed how? In the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He says, who came to redeem us, to buy us back from the sin that owns us. How did he do that? Jesus redeemed us by submitting himself to death on a cross. A death he did not deserve because unlike us, he was perfect and he was sinless. We're not perfect. And we're not sinless, are we, church? Truth is we're grumblers. We are faithless. You know what? Not Jesus. He's faithful. We are fault finders. We are complainers, but you know what? He was silent as a sheep before its shearer. We are driven by selfish motives. We follow our own natural instincts. But you know what? He followed the will of his father. Even when that will meant his own death. Christ's perfect obedience. We are imperfect, but Christ's perfect obedience is credited to us. Who are prone to disobedience. That's grace. We don't deserve it, but God offers it. And you know why God offers it? Scripture is very clear on this. Because he loves us. Love is his motivation. And you know what? That's the motivation and the power that we need to say no to sin and yes to God. A relationship with Jesus leads to changed behavior, but not out of obligation, out of desire. When we understand what Jesus has accomplished for us in his death, we will want to serve him with our lives. And when we are struggling to serve him with our lives, it may be that we should again ponder anew how he has served us. If we could do that, then we might sense again the great exchange of the cross. That he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we, the unrighteous, might become the righteousness of God. When we do that again, we might have a sense of being able to pray as Martin Luther did. Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness. I am your sin. You took on you what was mine, yet set on me what was yours. You became what you were not, that I might become was not. We are saved by God's grace. And so Paul says in Titus, by this grace and response to this grace, in response to it, we are trained in two things. First, we are trained in what to jettison, what to get rid of, what to put off, what to say no to. That is ungodly living. That is worldly passions. Second, we are trained in what to hold on to, what to keep, what to continue, what to make sure we do because we are God's. Namely, living self-controlled, upright, godly lives. And we do this, he says, while we wait. What are we waiting for? While we wait for our blessed 
heard. That's where we're going to pick up next week. Open your Bibles, if you would, as we move to another form of worship this morning. The first Corinthians.